Welcome to Recalculating Small Business. Like its award-winning book, Recalculating is dedicated to small business in America. Your hosts are Don Mazella and Dan Perkins. Don Mazella is the editor-in-chief of the Small Business Digest. Dan Perkins is a registered investment advisor with 43 years' experience in managing money. Dan Perkins here, your co-host, along with Don Mazella of Recalculating for Small Business. Our radio program is dedicated to you, helping the small business owners increase their profits. We draw our name from Recalculating, voted the best small business book of 2017 by the Independent Press. In this book, it features ways to grow your small business. Now, here's Don Mazzella. Dan, this program is all about small business. We have a new report on this vital economic driver, and here to talk about entrepreneurship in America is Global Head of Community for 5R, Brent Messenger. Brent, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. Well, I'm going to uh, talk about the first question, then turn it over to Dan, because he's far more familiar with you than I am. But uh, uh, I guess my first question is, uh, what is 5R, and uh, what about your report? Yeah, so Fiverr is a global marketplace for digital services for freelancers and small businesses. So uh, it's a service uh, that's available anywhere in the world. It's a global platform. We're in 150 countries. Uh, There's a transaction uh, every 3.7 seconds somewhere. Um, So it's it's a huge marketplace. The digital services that we're providing, as I said, are for small businesses and entrepreneurs, things like uh, graphic design, social media, Uh, logo design, voiceover, video editing, anything that can be delivered digitally that a small business needs, you can find on Fiverr. Really? Dan, I'm going to turn it back over to you. You used them before, and you know them much better than I do, but I'm glad they're with us. Yes, so am I. Um, It's it's a pleasure to to talk with you. My experience was I'm an author, and I – I wrote a children's book and I was looking for um, an illustrator and um, your name, your company name came up and I said, I I have never heard of these people. So I put out an inquiry and um, actually got an illustrator that um, I worked with. It was really strange. Um, I, I'm, worked with this particular woman over the internet who was in uh, Mumbai, India. And uh, um, we worked extremely well together in my first children's book. And when I decided to do a second one, I went back to her again. Um, And she's worked with me on the, the illustrations and we're now working on a third book together. Um, It was, what was amazing to me about your service. And I know I'm taking some of your time. I apologize. I'm just trying to, help the audience understand my experience. What, what impressed me about your service, what you said in the beginning when you introduced Don your company, that you can do a lot of different things if they're done digitally. And I was very skeptical about the idea of being able to work with a graphic artist over the Internet, never seeing directly, simply using email to communicate. And it was a phenomenal experience. I could see where you could be growing by leaps and bounds. But what I would really like to talk about now, after I've given you this wonderful two-minute commercial, is uh, <laughs> me. Um, so if you, if, uh, tell them how they can get a hold of your organization on the Internet. Right. So, uh, yeah, thank you for that. Um, that story you told, by the way, is a, is a pretty common story, and it's actually one of our favorites here, is hearing people that are doing something that's a, pa- that's a passion or creative project, and they find a partner, particularly one that they can collaborate with over and over and over again. As you probably learned, uh, there is a little bit of uh, sometimes apprehension about engaging over email and describing your creative vision, but then once, it, you, know, once you establish that connection and you, you share that common language and you have a style and an aesthetic, uh, you can keep using it. So uh, that's a great story. So thanks for sharing that. Uh, sure. Fiverr.com, F-I-V-E-R-R.com is, is the marketplace. Uh, again, any digital service you can imagine, you should take a look. Right. So let's talk about the survey that you conducted because 
we're always interested in information that has something to do with small business. So tell us about the reason you conducted the study, what you were looking for, and then what was your outcome? Yeah, so, you know, as you mentioned when you set this up, I'm the global head of community here at Fiverr. Uh, that means, you know, my interest is in better understanding our community, uh, the people who are using the service, the customers who are coming to our platform, and really getting under, under, so underneath the, the superficial stuff and understanding what makes them tick. So we created this report, uh, and we were trying to better understand the issues that were propelling small businesses in general and entrepreneurs toward, um, you know, success and what policies were, were holding them back. So we surveyed a 1,000 of our U.S.-based marketplace customers and just kind of asked them questions about big economic issues, startup roadblocks, costs, safety net, anything you can think of. And, and really what we found was that a lot of the things they were talking about were not the things that were the things that you hear about uh, coming out of Washington or coming out of local politicians. So issues of, for example, trade uh, or taxation, these were not the, the big things on their mind, believe it or not. Well, I believe it. Um, um... I wonder, as you were talking there, um, since you're a global company, why did you choose to do a survey with many American entrepreneurs? That's a great question. So I would say, uh, you know, first and foremost, the, the largest part of our marketplace is in the U.S. Uh, okay. The customers that come to our site, the majority are U.S.-based as are uh, a large number of the sellers. So, yes, it's a global market, but, but the U.S. is our core market, and, and this is where we're you know, having great success and really trying to understand uh, the marketplace. And it's so complex these days, you know, so it was, to us seemed to be a great place to start. So one question that I want to I follow up with is to, is to ask you, is there is – there, are there, whatever the right uh, pr pr uh, right word is, are there significant differences between entrepreneurs in other parts of the world than the United States? Well, that's a great question, and it's something that we think about a bit, but we haven't studied uh, specifically. But, you know, the one thing I can say, obviously, is that economic conditions make it a little bit different. Uh, access to broadband makes it a little bit different. Um, you can imagine the places where they don't have strong internet access. It makes it very hard to participate in a in a digital platform like you described. Obviously, you you collaborated with someone in Mumbai. They they obviously had adequate internet access, and they do in in India generally have pretty good internet access. But places mm -hmm. where they don't, that's a problem. So some of the hurdles that you might find in America, you might find even more so in other parts of the world. The so basic sort of threshold things: cost of living, access to internet, things like that. Good. Let's let's talk about your survey. How many questions? Sure. What were the, what were the things that you're uh, when, when you when you pull the survey, you 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 have a bunch of throwaway questions, and you might have three or four of what you're really looking for. So, what were you really looking for in the survey? What we wanted to know were well, the way we kind of framed it was what were what are the what are the barriers? You know, what are the startup roadblocks? Um, and how do you prioritize them? So this is, it, we were just trying to get at the very simple thing, which is what matters most to you. And I think the thing that's interesting and really important to kind of note in all this is, you know, there are 28 million small businesses across the United States. You know that. 23 million of them are, are uh, non-employer small businesses. What does that mean? That means that they are very, very small, uh, one-person, two-person shops. A lot of these are the kind of businesses that are accessing Fiverr because they're trying to establish their brand, get their logo created, create an, create an a digital advertisement, uh, create their social presence, all of these things, create their website. So they're on Fiverr trying to do that. So what we really wanted to understand was what, what, you know, what's holding them back, um, what can we do to help them really, you know, as we're sort of shaping our our perspectives on policy, uh, how can we become a voice for these entrepreneurs to help propel them forward? So what we discovered, uh, like I mentioned, it wasn't issues like trade. You know, it wasn't issues like, uh, you know, bringing back uh, manufacturing jobs or coal jobs. It wasn't necessarily tax reform. The things they were interested in were the things that were directly impacting their day-to-day -day lives. Cost of living, 
number one. Uh, access to startup capital uh, and capital to grow their businesses. Reliable broadband, which I mentioned a minute ago, even though it was a U.S.-based survey, access to reliable broadband is still a problem uh, for, for, for our community. Um, creating more competition in the economies and markets was also important to them. Um, on that note about broadband, one of the things that we learned that was a very important finding was that uh, these people weren't necessarily concentrated in the big cities in the, the U.S. In fact, many of them were, were, were throughout the country. So in rural areas, people are, are on Fiverr. They're, they're, using, you know, they're building their small business, and they're trying to create a global company for themselves, but they're not in New York or they're not in San Francisco or Los Angeles. There are other places. So access to reliable broadband, kind of a big deal. Um, yeah. I'm, uh, I'm one of those uh, non-New Yorkers. I, I conduct several small businesses here on an island in the Gulf of Mexico. Well, that sounds fantastic. Uh, but, yes, I can imagine reliable broadband being, being a problem for you. And, 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 frankly, you know, I think cost of living, it's important to everybody. So it's not necessarily a surprise uh, that, that's, that that's, a, that's important to small business owners. But it is, it is an interesting disconnect with, again, the sort of noise we hear out of our elected officials, be they in Washington or even our local districts. Uh, they're often talking about these big issues and saying, I'm for small business. I want to spur the economy along. Let's talk about trade. Let's talk about taxes. But the, the, the little guy is talking about where the rubber hits the road. How much does it cost to live in the locale they live in? You know, how can they get the small amount of money they need to get started? Why is the access, why is access to capital you know, only available to few and the people in the, in the power centers? Uh, those are the things that are on their mind. Uh, then I want to jump in here and ask a, a, a question off the uh, uh, where you are, but uh, how did they come up with the name 5R? And can you spell it out with your website for people? Sure, it's F I V E R R. It's Fiverr uh, dot com. F I V E R R dot com. The name is it's kind of funny. Uh, it, it's originally started out as a as a marketplace where people would do things for five dollars. And I think the original idea behind it was, what would you know? What would you deliver if you could deliver something digitally? What would you do for five bucks? This is uh, seven years ago. So the company has transformed uh, quite a bit since then, and, and in fact, um, there is you know the, the entrepreneur, the freelancer that's that's on Fiverr providing these services can charge anything they want. Uh, very few of them you know charge five dollars for anything anymore. That's kind of an, an antiquated idea, but that's where it started. So that's that's where the name originated from. Well, I, I have another question, but it will have to wait until we hear from uh, one of our sponsors. Then we'll be right back. At Valero, we believe life gets lived between every fill-up. So whether you go down the road on two wheels or four, whether your Wednesday night is spent racing to the grocery store or down a track, and whether you're dropping off the mail, the pizza, the kids, or all of the above, we're here to make sure you're never running on empty. Valero top-tier certified quality fuel keeps your engine running cleaner, better, and longer. Find a station near you at ValeroCleanGas.com. We're here with the global head of community for 5R, Brent Messenger. He's here to talk about uh, a lot of things, his his survey, which I found fascinating. I know Dan did, but I'll I'll ask one more question and turn it over to Dan. But um, I guess what, what is the most popular usage of your site and how did that come about? Well, that's a great question. So, uh, and it's also a challenging question because it changes, uh, you know, the, the sort of top categories, the most access categories changes relatively frequently. Um, but I would say a lot of the digital marketing services are, are incredibly popular. Uh, we recently launched a category where people could um, – engage with a freelancer who will develop a chat bot for them. I don't know if you're familiar with chat bots, but companies use these for uh, expediting customer service. So we launched a chat bot category, and that's, that's uh, incredibly popular. People are excited about that. Um, 
you know, a lot of people do voiceover on Fiverr. That's something that, uh, that people uh, have a need for when they're, they're doing a marketing video or something like that. Uh, lots and lots of logos. Companies looking for logos uh, starting up will, will purchase a logo on Fiverr. So, you know, the most popular sort of ships around, but, but those are a couple of them. Dan, I'll back to you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Brent, um, you, um, in thinking about your business model, um, you're kind of like a, a specialty store like Macy's, for example, who sells out floor space inside the building for clothing and shoes and jewelry and perfume and takes a piece of the action when the merchants sell something in their store. Is that how you're compensated? That's a, an interesting analogy. Yeah, it's a marketplace company. So I would say another analogy would be something like Amazon, for example, where we have uh, sellers who come into our marketplace and they offer a service. Again, they can price it any way they like, but they, you know, when they sell it, then we take, we take a percentage of the transaction. So it's a marketplace company. Um, the one thing that makes us a little bit different from our competitors, we, we say that we, are, uh, we have productized services. Uh, and what that means is someone will say, I will do something for you, you know, start to finish. I will complete this project or task for you for a set amount of money. Some of our, some of our uh, competitors in the, in the freelance marketplace space, uh, you know, they'll, they'll help a, a customer engage on sort of an hourly basis. Uh, with ours, it's it's project based, so productized services. So what I what I did when I used your service uh, in working with the artist, I told her what what my needs were, and she gave me a price per illustration, and a time a specific time frame of when the project was going to be completed, which was important to me because I was working with a publisher and I wanted to meet a deadline. Um, let me let me go on. Um, let me uh, not really ask you a political question, but but it may have some political implications. Um, Don and I started this show. We had another show, and we basically abandoned that show to start this show because we believed that the economy, American economy, had been so suppressed, not depressed, but suppressed by the Obama administration with all of its, its regulations and, and, and penalties and everything else, that we saw very little economic growth over the eight years of the president's uh, two terms. And we felt that with Mr. Trump coming in, being more of a businessman and a person who wanted to cut regulations to make America free or freer to do business, that there was going to be a, a, an upsurge in uh, people interested in taking risk and wanting to start new businesses. Has, has there been any change in the number of people buying your you know, That's a really interesting question. Uh, I would, there has not been any difference uh, that we could perceive based on the change in the administration. Uh, and our, our company has continued to grow and, you know, it, it's on the, it's on the same trajectory it's been on uh, continually, which is to say a very, very steep uh, uphill trajectory, but it's, it's um, I mean, it's doing incredibly, the company's doing very well, growing and growing and growing, but there hasn't been a change uh, in, in the administration. I think it's interesting, though, um, because there are a few notes and a couple of things in there. You said it, you know, it's a sort of political question, because I, the, the one thing that has been on our mind a lot is, again, going back to this notion of um, these these non-employer small businesses, the 23 million of them in the country, is that you know, we've been talking to a lot of people who are very concerned about benefits, uh, about health care coverage, uh, and accessing other types of benefits that other types of workers get to access. So this, this notion of portable benefits. And, I, and it's, it's actually one thing that people have become more concerned about under, under the current administration is that they're not going to be able to have access to health care. And what we're, what, we, what we're concerned with is that that could potentially encourage people to stay in jobs, you know, that they don't want to not pursue their passions, to not go out and start, uh, you know, a new, uh, a new business, uh, you know, take that risk to become an author or take that risk to become a graphic designer or do whatever, pursue a passion 
that they're being locked into jobs when they don't have access to benefits. So, yeah. Again, we haven't noticed any difference, but it is something that, that's on our radar. You know, it's interesting. Um, uh, when I listened to the Obamacare debate between the, in the House and the Senate, and I, I, I couldn't help but ask a question. And that is, is it the responsibility of the central government to provide health care to everybody? It's a and, fair question. <laughs> yeah, and, I, and I'm, I'm, I'm in the camp that says, where does it say in the Constitution that everybody has a right to health care? And, you know, maybe, maybe the problem with what's going on is that we're asking the wrong question. Maybe we should be asking the question as small business people, not whether our, whether our employees need health care. There's no question about that. But should the government at all be involved in telling us what we have to provide in health care benefits for our employees? You know, and I think thing- that's a fair question. I would ask you a question, uh, which is a, a sort of similar is, is it the right way, uh, is it right that the employer that should be the, per, the, the entity that provides the benefits? I think, and I think it's the, it's the perspective of Fiverr, is uh, that more small business would happen if people could access benefits on their own, if they could afford them and access them as individuals, and that they were truly portable. No matter where they went, the benefits stayed with them, whatever, if it was their health care or their life insurance or any of these other things that sometimes are tied to, you know, 401ks and things that are sometimes tied to employment, that really tethering those to traditional employment is kind of an outdated model. So if that's just something I would, I would ask you back. Well, I would say to you that the idea uh, of portability between employers, uh, I would, I'd have to think really long and hard about that because the, the only way that you can provide for, quote, universal health care and portability in health care is if the government provides it. You have to have a single provider. Because if you don't have a single provider, then the variances from one, one supplier to the other um, uh, creates a problem. Now, if you had, as Mr. Trump has suggested, if we had competition across state boards, and we didn't have these kinds of restrictions of the state insurance commissions, then if an employee, the company that's doing business, whether it's Aetna or United Healthcare, whoever, is doing business in all 50 states, then it becomes possible for that United Healthcare employee to, to take those benefits across the United States. Right now, you can go to, you can join AARP anywhere in the country, and you can get their Medicare supplement program and it's good in all 50 states. One, one place, one policy provided by an insurance company. So it's, it's possible to do that without the government if you open up the restrictions and eliminate the restrictions based on borders. Uh, I don't know how quickly that's, that's going to happen. But I, I want to go back to the differences. You said that your survey showed that your interpretation of the survey is that the issues that are important to small business are not important to what's being said by the politicians, either locally in the, or in the federal government, meaning that big business, which is a small portion of the total employment in the United States, has more influence of moving the agenda one way or the other. Yeah, it would certainly seem, and, and, and I think that's a fair interpretation. I mean, and, and, you know, one of my interpretations of the results was that what should be most important is that policymakers, you know, they recognize that there's been a shift in the way people work and earn money and that they need to consider ways to evolve, uh, again, like the, the safety net, and, and, and they need to think a little bit more about the future of work. And if they were doing that, they would then be serving again, this large 23 million small businesses that are really driving the economy right now. I mean, this, this idea of contingent workforce, this future of work uh, that, that we were just talking about, that's, that's what's happening. Uh, that's a real driver in this, in this economy, and I think that more politicians need to be paying attention to it. Again, in the last political cycle, you know, both sides uh, spending a lot of time talking about bringing back Rust Belt manufacturing jobs. 
and you know, uh, bringing back coal mining and some of these older, older economy jobs. Now, there's nothing wrong with those jobs, nothing wrong with the people that do those jobs, but this other part of the country, uh, uh, this other part of the economy, rather, is growing you know, incredibly rapidly, uh, and, and the, pol- the policymakers don't seem to be helping. Yeah. How much time do we have, Brent? Um, uh, Dan, I'd like to interrupt the, the two things. Brent, your website again? Fiverr, F I V E R R dot com, Fiverr. And uh, uh, I'd like to get the last question in, which is uh, what was uh, surprised you the most about the survey results? Again, I think I think that really most the most surprising thing was that again that sort of confusion in the prioritization with our leaders, and again that is that is uh, a bipartisan criticism. Um, they're they're not focused on on the things that are really going to spur this incredibly important, rapidly growing part of the economy, which are these sort of micro entrepreneurs, if you will. Uh, that are really driving growth. And so my hope would be in the future that they would, policymakers would start to pay attention. My hope is that Fiverr can be a voice for them uh, across the country. Hmm. Well, uh, uh, we don't have uh, any more time except to thank you. We, we, we've been t- uh, talking with Br- Brent Messenger. Um, uh, we hope he'll b- come back again and talk more about that in his com- company. Uh, your website again, Brent, before we let you go? Fiverr.com, F-I-V-E-R-R.com. And I just want to thank you both for having me on. It's been a great, great time. I enjoyed the conversation. Thank you, Brent. Well, thank, thank you for thank you. the great information you brought. Um, uh, we'll be back with our next guest after this word. Life. It's made up of the simple day-to-day moments that keep us all running on full, full of joy, passion, and restlessness. It's singing full on to your car radio with the windows wide open. It's a whole bunch of early morning rush hours and a few late night runs for Rocky Road. It's full of pit stops and drive throughs It's life, and we live it between fill-ups at Valero. Valero top-tier certified quality fuel keeps your engine running cleaner, better, and longer. Find a station near you at ValeroCleanGas.com. Dan Perkins here from Recalculating.biz with your small business tip of the day. Small business funding is easier these days thanks to a new breed of lender called fintech lenders. These internet-based lenders cut the time between applying for funds and getting the funds to just hours instead of months. They also make it easier to repay your loans, but their costs might be a little higher for their service. The next time you need dollars for your small business, try them. You might like the change. I'm Dan Perkins for Recalculating.biz and your small business tip of the day. Well, Dan, our next guest is Saneria Madani. She's founder and CEO of Fat Urchin. She's here to talk about the ways businesses can protect themselves from fraud and what the role of their credit card processor is when it happens. Suniri, welcome to the program. Thank you so much, Dan and Don. Excited to be here. Dan, you take it over. Go ahead, right ahead. Credit card, first of all, thanks again for joining us. Um, this, this is a subject that's always uh, been of interest to me. I, uh, I used to do contract negotiations with major affinity groups on credit card relationships. And so I, I know a little bit about that particular business. What is interesting to me is the difference in credit card protection in the United States, I'm saying, I'm saying now in general, versus credit card protection in Europe. Why is it, do you think, that Europe was uh, so far ahead of us? So, I mean, to going back to, I mean, they've been in compliance. I mean, Europe has been PCI compliant, I mean, EMV compliant for, you know, decades. The United States is actually the last one of the last countries to actually take on EMV compliance. And I think it comes, like, from top down. Uh, we actually don't have a ton of regulation within the payment card industry, and that's why companies like Fat Merchant, um, you know, we're changing, we're changing that. We want more regulation. We want to have better compliance. We want our customers to be protected. Um, and so, you know, other countries have been well advanced in terms of that, but also it's their banking networks as well um, that have allowed EMV adoption across, um, like across Europe. But I'm excited to tell you a little bit more about what we can do here in the United States and, you know, get our, our, you know, our small businesses up to date on technology to protect from fraud. 
I think that's a, that's a, a great uh, point because uh, with the changes in the the technology, um, I have seen on a local basis here in Southwest Florida, there are many places that have the chip readers but don't have chip capacity. And um, I've also seen some people replace already replaced their readers. So is there um, is are there conflicts in the uh, in the chip readers and the and the chip technology that's still not been flushed out in the United States? There there are some, but not many. And I think it comes it literally will come down to the business owner's decision of wanting to be EMV compliant, but also their processor's capability in, in allowing it. So there, there's a couple components to it, and that's one great way for business owners today to protect themselves against fraud is one just by being EMV compliant. And so EMV, um, you know, are those little chips that we have, we all have them now. So the credit card companies have all issued us or should have issued us um, an EMV compliant credit card. And it's really important that we try to use it as much as we can because we're, you know, we're protecting ourselves with other layers um, because every time that the card is dipped or inserted, it's actually a tokenized. There's a new number that's, you know, that can't be re- that, that can't be recreated or skimmed. And so the process is a little bit longer when you're standing in line or at the checkout and it's waiting for that authorization. But at the end of the day, it's protecting you as a cardholder and it's also protecting the business from fraudulent activity. Now, in 2015 is when the, you know EMV adoption was supposed to take place nationwide. And I think with any sort of technology, it's going to take time for adoption. And so the way that the card brands have pushed out the rollout is that for EMV cards, if you're, if you're a business owner and you're not accepting chip-based and pin-based cards, then you are held liable for the fraud that takes place at your location, at your retail store, um, you know, or at, you know, at the point of purchase. So you are actually held liable for that chargeback that may occur. Whereas if you are EMV compliant and fraud does take place and it was a chip, it was a chip card, then you are not liable for that transaction. So there was a shift in liability that took place in 2015. However, again, it's going to go back on adoption. Business owners have not fully, um, you know, fully integrated, um, you know, into the, you know, have, have accepted EMV. And a couple of the reasons that we see today from customers is, you know, oh, it's, it's really slow and, you know, it slows down my line or it takes, it takes longer to take the transaction to their, you know, their current providers have locked them into um, really long leases of equipment for accepting, you know, like the actual the credit card terminals. And they haven't been able to get out of contracts or been able to upgrade their technology. And my advice to these business owners is get compliant and find um, you know, a processor that is, in, that is EMV compliant from end to end, so not just on the reader end, but also on the gateway end, et cetera. And so, for example, Fat Merchant, we are completely EMV compliant. We've actually been, since the inception of our business, we've been actually, we were doing EMV even before it was required that we had to do EMV. So all of our customers have EMV compliant terminals. They can take really cool technology like Apple Pay and Samsung Pay and anything else that may come about. Um, they can take, you know, swipe regular credit cards, but if the, if the customer has a chip-enabled card, it will tell them, you know, you have to insert the chip. And we even have that across the board, so it's not just on the terminals, but also even on mobile swipers, which is another thing that we're seeing in businesses that they're accepting, um, you know, they're taking transactions, but the mobile swipers are not EMV compliant. So that's another place that the technology has to, you know, as a business owner, you have to really put that technology from end to end, and it's not expensive to do so. So, Mary, uh, Dan, let me interrupt for two things. Uh, first, tell us your, your website. But before you do, I have something across my desk from a, a listener. Can you slow down a little bit? Um, uh, uh, you're, you're saying so much valuable information. That, yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, and we want to make sure we all hear it correctly. But first, start Absolutely. with your website. Absolutely. So, our website is fatmerchant.com. That's F A T T merchant.com, M E R C H A N T.com. And Fat Merchant actually stands for Fast Affordable Transactions Technology. And just a really quick, just a little bit about us we're the first subscription based merchant services provider. So we've actually completely disrupted the payments industry and taken it on the head. Um, I've been in the industry for, you know, 
a really long time, and I started off as an agent in payment. And I hated everything about the industry from how the lack of transparency worked for customers, the crazy rates and fees that they're paying, the lack of regulation where banks and you know, providers could increase their rates, lock them into these contracts, not provide technology. Um, and it really wasn't, it's not advantageous to the business owner. And I never once met a business owner that was like, I love my credit card processor. I love the experience with my payment company. That you just don't hear that. You know, it's just a necessary evil that's taking 5% off of my bottom line. And that's something that we set out to change. And the way that we've done that is we give every business owner, regardless of their volume, direct access to Visa, MasterCard, Discover, and American Express wholesale rates. So they're getting the rates that, that Walmarts are getting. They're getting the rates that Best Buys are getting. They never have to re- negotiate their rate again because we don't make any money on the payment on the transaction itself. So we're not taking a cut of the transaction exactly how all the banks are taking it or merchant providers. Because traditionally, they are charging their own percentage on top of Visa's percentage. And at Fat Merchant, instead of charging the variable percentages, we give every business owner access to direct costs, but we ask for a monthly membership. So we're a subscription-based service. So our service is um, you know, about $79, $99 a month. And with that subscription, you get you know, access to direct costs. You don't have a contract. You don't have to worry about statement fees or compliance fees. You get all the security, the tools, the membership, the EMV technology. So we have everything all included in the membership. And that's Fat Merchant. Again, that's F-A-T-T Merchant.com. Wow. Uh, Dan, uh, uh, you know, it's hard to ask a question after she's so complete like that. (laughs) But I'll I'll let Dan Dan, go ahead. I'm sure you do. I got one for you. Yeah. Uh, what, let's let's just step back for a moment, and let's not make an assumption. Let's say I'm not saying that you are. Let's not. I'm just saying in general. Let's not make an assumption. Take a, take a few minutes to tell the American consumers that are listening to this program why the chip in their credit card makes them more secure. So the way that the chip is designed. And the why it's more secure is that every time that you run a transaction, it is authorizing that credit card, but the card number changes. It's tokenized every single time you run that credit card. And so unlike before where you had a magnetic um, swipe on the back of the credit card, your credit card number is the same. So when you're going to swipe that card, anyone can take that credit card number and then charge it anywhere else because it's the same card, whereas with EMV, it changes on every single transaction. And so even if somebody does get a hold of your credit card information, it's absolutely useless because they can't run that number because it's tokenized. And that's why it's, that's how it's protecting you as a consumer. There was a a story not too long ago um, in, in three unlikely places of, and I'm just quoting from the article that there were, they didn't say whether they were legal or illegal, but they were operating in the state of Ohio, Kentucky, and Florida, probably other places. And they were breaking into the gasoline pumps and putting in their own readers to read the credit card numbers of people who were buying gas because they were still using the magnetic tape to swipe with. And um, it, it was it's so bad that the... Uh, the various state agencies were suggesting that you not use your credit card, in fact, to pay cash for your uh, gasoline because of the insecurity of the readers in the gas pump. Uh, There are, I'm sure there've been a lot of people, a lot of organizations that have switched to the chip reader, but you know, one organization that hasn't switched to the chip, at least not yet, United States Postal Service. When you walk into the post office, you got to swipe your card, and um, you can't read the read the chip. So uh, there's still a lot of rollout to be done, isn't there? Absolutely. I mean, I I think that EMV adoption we're still we're just in the you know in the beginning phases of it, and it's going to be one industry kind of at a time that's going to lead that way. 
and I still believe that we're, we're still about three to four years out um, for from that full adoption of EMV. How much do you you've think? Seen big, you've seen bigger organizations, even such as Disney, that still don't have EMV, and they're choosing they're choosing not to become EMV compliant um, because it's you know, it's slow, you know and their reasoning is the amount of fraud that is happening. You know, it's 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 easier for them. It's more profitable for them not to be EMV EMV compliant. So they're okay with taking on that that fraud. Um, and I think it's really important for every business to evaluate um, in terms of the, you know every business owner should know what their chargeback ratio is, how much fraud you know do, usually does take place in their place of business. And there are certain industry types that are more prone um, you know to it than others. And so you should you know you really need to do your research as a business owner and align yourself with um, you know, with the right technology as well as the right processor. Don, do I have another question time for, for a question? Before yeah. break? Yes, you do. You got one oh. more question. Okay. We, we've got to take a commercial break here shortly. Um, so do you think as we become, we get over the hump and we, we are more compliant and less compliant, will that have an impact on fraud? Yes, it will have an impact on fraud. We're already seeing that impact on fraud. So as soon as EMV was rolled out, that's EMV is on card present transactions, right? So that's pre- preventing fraud. You're, you know, dipping and inserting your card at a, at a point of purchase. However, you saw fraud shift and then move online. And so there was still, um, you know, there's still fraud that's going to take place. But then the online business owners were targeted because EMV hasn't reached you know, you can't put EMV, you know, um, it's, it's not it's on a card present situation. However, um, you know, you can put tools and things in place as a business owner. So even with online fraud, so even if it's not EMV, so EMV is something that you can do um, right away in your place of business. If you have a, you know, if you have a retail um, style or you're taking, you're taking credit card transactions face to face. If you are an online retailer, even an online business, there are also tools that you can do, such as, you know, you can do address verification. You can ensure that you're asking for the CVD of the customer. You can have, you know, velocity limits. So for example, if a customer is trying to run the card multiple amount of times, your system should be able to kind of stop that. So you can put limits even on the transactions per day or the, or the ticket amounts. Uh, so there's tons of tools um, as a business owner that you can do to apply, and I highly, highly encourage every business owner to understand what tools are out there. Um, and, you know, you can come, you know, feel free to reach out to us at Fat Merchant. We provide all of these tools in all of our technology. So we've been really ahead um, in terms of, you know, in terms of fraud prevention, and we already have all these tools in place when it comes to for e-commerce stores, even for customers taking invoices to add that ad- address verification, to add those hard limits. It's really important to have, you know, be with a processor that, you know, can provide you with um, all these technologies to help protect your business. Uh, I know and we're going to for free. We, okay. Well, we have to stop here a moment uh, to hear from, from one of our sponsors, and we'll be right back. with Sanera Madani. From Fat Merchant. But first, a word from our sponsor. Before you hear this or this. Or even this. Before you turn a key, step on the gas and let it rip. Before you get up and out and on the road, you have to be fueled by something. Make sure that something is Valero. Valero top-tier certified quality fuel keeps your engine running cleaner, better, and longer. Find a station near you at ValeroCleanGas.com. We've been asked recently by a number of people, how can they listen to past shows? And if you go to recalculating.biz, you'll find a link to iHeartRadio, which will allow you to go back and listen to shows that you didn't get a chance to finish or never heard. So we encourage you to go there, recalculating.biz. We're here with Sanira Madani of Fat Merchant. We're talking about credit card fraud, how to prevent it. And we're back to you, Dan. Thank you, Sanira. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask you about before we went into the break was, we talked a little bit about fraud. What about identity theft? Can your program help with identity theft? No, we're not focused on on identity theft in terms of um, where we deal with payment side of the business. So we help businesses get set up with their credit card processing, and we can help you know prevent fraud on the credit card end. 
but not on like I can't help somebody if their identity gets stolen online. There's other tools that, you know, you can, you know, there's other companies and tools that can help with that, but that's not something that we do at Fat Merchant. You, you mentioned, go ahead, Don. No, I was, I was, I was going to go a totally different direction than, and then how did you get into this business and how did you come to found the company and, and what are some of the obstacles you overcame? That's a great question. It's actually probably the one that people ask me the most. Um, Fat Merchant, I started this company out of frustration. So I was working in the payments industry, um, selling merchant services to small businesses um, in Orlando, Florida. And I loved working with small businesses. Any way that I wanted to help a small, and I come from a family of small businesses, and it's just a big passion of mine helping small businesses. But I hated the product that I was selling, and that was merchant services. And the reason why I hated selling it too much uh, was because, one, it was a commoditized business, and uh, there's, there's way too many people with the same exact pitch of, let me see your credit card statement. I could beat your rate. And the reason why everyone can beat each other's rates is that Visa, MasterCard, Discover, and American Express, they set, they set the rates every year, and that's known as interchange. And that, those rates are the same across the board for every provider. So it didn't matter if it was the company that I was working with at the time, it's First Data, it's Bank of America, SunTrust, Fat Merchant, PayPal, Stripe, whoever it may be, Visa sets the rates every year. But how credit card processing companies make money is that they charge an additional percentage on each and every transaction of that business owner. And when I learned that cost was the same for every provider, and as a millennial that's subscribing to every product now under the sun that you can think of, I was like, why can't subscription be applied to payments where every retailer and business owner gets access to direct cost, just like Walmart does, and they don't have to negotiate their rates every year like they have to, and no one can come in and undercut it. And so we're the first subscription-based merchant services provider where we give everyone 0% markup, like 0%. We have no actual rate for our credit cards. We give every business owner access to direct costs. So it's kind of like a wholesale club like Costco, but for payments. And we're able to save business owners 30 to 40% on their credit card processing fees. I mean, that's what we do. You can go to fatmerchant.com, check it out. You can do a savings analysis. You can do a uh, savings analysis directly yourself or you can send us uh, a copy of your one month statement and we can show you exactly how we're able to, you know, save you money and it's down to the transaction end. So I, I hated the industry that I was in and I took the idea back to my old bosses and they laughed in my face and said, why would we want to, you know, sell a product with no contract? Why would we want to provide technology and security technology and fraud technology and free EMV terminals to customers? And, you know, also, you know, why would you want to save them the amount of money that you're, you know, asking us to save them and charge a flat fee? So I decided to quit and start my own payments company. And it's been, um, you know, three years since we launched Fat Merchant. However, we're backed by Vantive, which is, one, you know, the largest payment transaction house, you know, in the United States today. Um, and we launched the company and we gained so much recognition for our disruptive pricing model and for the technology. And for the last three years, I mean, we've already processed, we're not a tiny company by any means. We've already processed a billion dollars in transactions, um, you know, year to date already. And we're, you know, we've had, we've received tons and tons of awards for our tremendous, uh, you know, our tremendous model, our, you know, our disruptive pricing model, as well as for our technology. And we can integrate yeah. with any way the business is doing payments today. Well, yet you've, in effect, uh, possibly disru uh, disrupted uh, um, a, a 30 or 40 year uh, industry. W what obstacles did you have to, uh, to overcome? I mean, I mean, so many obstacles. I mean, one is, you know, fundraising for the business. And so, you know, who, you know, just where do you even start a payments company? Where do you go find Mr. Visa? And so just kind of getting through the regulation hump. <laughs> in 2013 was its own battle. Um, and then going from there, I mean, we've raised, um, you know, a good amount of venture capital to help, you know, fuel and fund the company. But the way that we bootstrapped the company was we actually, you know, applied to every pitch competition and business competition um, that we could get our names in. And we ended up winning over $200,000 in prize money. And that's how we fueled and like bootstrapped the business. And when we received, we got a ton of press from like Fast Company, from Forbes, Tech crunch, you know, I mean, you name it, Fortune, 
And from there, that kind of, um, you know, our phones just have, you know, never stopped ringing. And we validated that, you know, we have an amazing concept and we want to bring transparency to every business owner. One of the best stats, I mean, we put back over $10 million in the last, you know, just in the last three years, just in central Florida, like back in our own backyard from savings from uh, processing. So we're really excited about what we do. Dan, back to you. One of the things that I'm curious about is when you start a business, and I've worked with people in starting businesses, almost exactly at the same time you start it, you begin to think about their exit strategy. Do you have an exit strategy as the founder and owner of this business? I think that, you know, there, I think that there may be, you know, potential exits for the company, but our goal is to bring Fat Merchant. I want Fat Merchant to be a household name. And so, you know, for us, we're competing directly against the banks, against the big guys, and we've made a name for ourselves. And so for, for, for Fat Merchant, we're just, uh, you know, we want to, we want, we're here to, to not worry about the exit in mind, um, but to build a really, really great company. Do you isn't the isn't the processing part of the business uh, seeing a lot of startups come and a lot of startups who be start to become successful and begin to interfere with the pricing model being given opportunities to exit the market? Are you asking if that's what I'm seeing, or is that, I'm sorry no. I didn't follow the question. In, in my years of experience of working in the credit card business, processors start up, they develop a niche for themselves, and uh, typically what happens that I've seen, I'm not saying in all cases, but in many cases, uh, they wind up being purchased by a bigger processor uh, just on the basis of the bigger processor trying to eliminate competition. But they make it so lucrative for the people to sell, it's hard to say no. I mean, you know, definitely that does take place. I, I haven't seen any processors, you know, personally in my experience, buy out another processor because of their price. They're usually acquiring um, another book of business because they're really focused on like a, a, an industry vertical or they have customers that, that this processor wants to acquire. Uh, but there are definitely tons of strategic exit opportunities as well. I mean, our goal and our mission and vision for the company is to provide its Payment world domination with the best, you know, experience is what we call it. And so for us, we want to we want to get these banks to uh, we want to shake it up and show that you know it doesn't have to be the 30 year old way. And we're not looking to get out of the way anytime soon. So we're looking to to continue to on our model of transparency. How much time do we have, Don? Oh, you got about well, time for one more uh, question and one more answer. So let me let me take you in a little bit different direction. There are a lot of, there's a lot of press and a lot of ballyhoo that Bitcoin is going to replace cash and credit. What do you think? I think that cash is definitely something that is going to be obsolete. So my, I mean, that's my, my personal opinion. And, you know, I, I do believe that there's not going to be a need for cash. But and I, I don't think that, it, and for Bitcoin, I think that Bitcoin will definitely you know, or, or, or cryptocurrency, whether it's Bitcoin or other types of currencies, I do believe that they will have a presence in the marketplace. Um, but I also believe in, you know, in all the, in other forms of payments as well. So I do see a shift in like that, that technology will bring in terms of con and in for the consumer end for payments from the business end of payments. And businesses need to be ready to adopt these forms of payment uh, because cash is, is, is becoming less and less used. I mean, we could just see even just from plastic, even with credit cards, um, you know, over the last um, 10 years on how that's evolved. And so I do feel that there will be a, a home for these cryptocurrencies and other types of currencies and other mobile payments too. I mean, that's something that, that we're not taking, you know, that, you know, as consumers, we're starting to adopt even more, but business owners aren't still fully accepting of mobile payments. Um, you're going to see that. And so, you know, if, as a business owner, you should, you should be thinking about these things to be able to accept all forms of payment. Um, and that's what, you know, that's what we help business owners do. Like with Fat Merchant, you can accept, you know, EMV transactions, you can accept the Apple Pay, you can accept Samsung Pay, whatever's going to come, you need to be with a processor that's ahead of that technology so that 
however it is you're able to collect that transaction from that customer. But I don't think it'll be Bitcoin that's going to take over the world. However, I do think that there's going to be non-cash currencies uh, and cash will be obsolete. Oh, wish we had more time. We've been talking with Sanira Madani. She's founder and CEO of Fat Merchant. And, uh, she's all about uh, reducing uh, our merchants' costs and uh, providing better services. So, uh, Sanira, please tell us your website again, and thank you so much for joining us. Joining yeah, us. of course. Well, I'm so glad to be here, and I'm, you know, always get excited um, to, you know, to talk about payments in any capacity. So you can go to our website at fatmerchant.com. That's F-A-T-T merchant.com. Um, again, www.fatmerchant.com, and we have all the EMV tools for you, the security tools for you, um, and we'll, you know, we'll save you a ton of money. So give us, you know go online and talk to one of our payment consultants about your business, even if you don't want to sign up, but, you know, get educated, you know, and learn thank about you. what your options are. Thank, thank you, so, you much. so much. For, thank you. Thank you guys. Bye. Matt, a uh, link to her website will be on, on our website tomorrow. Uh, in the meantime, a word from our sponsor before we hear from Dan. At Valero, we believe life gets lived between every fill up. So whether you go down the road on two wheels or four, whether your Wednesday night is spent racing to the grocery store or down a track, and whether you're dropping off the mail, the pizza, the kids, or all of the above, we're here to make sure you're never running on empty. Valero top-tier certified quality fuel keeps your engine running cleaner, better, and longer. Find a station near you at ValeroCleanGas.com. Want to know more about health savings accounts for your company or yourself? Go to 2HSA.com and get a free employer's primer. Health savings accounts are a cost-effective way of offering health care benefits to your employees and yourself. HSAs build retirement funds for your employees, improve morale, and reduce your health care benefit costs. For a free employer guide to HSAs, go to 2HSA.com. That's 2HSA.com. Dan Perkins here from Recalculating.biz with your small business tip of the day. Should I grow my business or stay the size that I am? One of the most difficult decisions about a small business is should I try to grow it? And if I want to grow, what is the best way to do it? If you look at the internet, you can find lots of advice on how to expand your business. So here's your Recalculating.biz small business tip of the day. Go to the SBA.gov website and you'll find 10 ideas of how to grow your business. They're not in order of importance, they're just 10 ideas. Some may be more suitable, others may not for you and your business. The one that struck me was at another store. My brother-in-law started with one pizza shop and over the last 15 years he's grown to five. You may not have a storefront, but a service business. So look at your competitors and see if they might be willing to sell or merge with you. This has been Dan Perkins with your Recalculating.biz Small Business Tip of the Day. Well, Dan, we've come to the end of another show. Well, uh, what do you think? Well, all right. I had a good time. Uh, interesting that were two things that I knew a lot about, the uh, the uh, Fiverr and, and then the uh, the credit card processing side. Uh, so it was interesting. Uh, I'm glad she talked to the, uh, to the consumer about the advantages of the chip and uh, – and the end of the Fiverr, I think that I hope a lot of our our listeners who are thinking about resources that they might need in their small business, uh, I found them, uh, the people that I work with, to be very accommodative and uh, were competitive. In fact, actually got into a little bit of a bidding process. At one time, I had five people bidding on the illustrations for Peter the Little Irish Seal. So... The thing I like about Fiverr, you can get talent without having to hire the talent. That means your money can go farther. You can you can give yourself a look of a big company with a small amount of dollars. So I, all in all, I was I was very pleased with the content on the show today. Well, well, we now just have time for two things: for you to say goodbye, and, and, and so say goodbye, Dan. Goodbye, Dan. <laughs> uh, and remember, recalculating 
helping to keep you on the road to success. Thank you for joining us on Recalculating. We hope the information you received on today's episode was helpful to you in starting and growing your business. Please go to our website, recalculating.biz, to help you be successful 